you get all of the praise. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Come on, let's praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Hallelujah. And Lord, we praise you according to your excellent greatness. Hallelujah.
us lift them up tonight. Hallelujah. Let us continue to lift up the name of Jesus tonight. Do you excited that you're in the house of God tonight? If you're excited, lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us draw our mind as we go in prayer. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight, Jesus. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Hallelujah. Father, we give you the glory and the praise that you're worthy of tonight, God. Lord, your name is to be praised, oh God. So we come tonight, God, to exalt your name. We come to exalt your name tonight, Jesus, because you have been good to us, Lord. Father, as we come to you tonight, Lord, hallelujah. God, we got sick among us, Lord. We got those that are in need of healing tonight, Jesus. Oh God, we pray tonight, Lord, that you will heal tonight, God. Oh God, remember every power on air tonight, Lord. Those that are in need of salvation, God. Oh God, those that are in need of deliverance, oh God. Hallelujah. Father, we pray tonight, remember those that need a plan of salvation. Father, we pray tonight that you will touch their heart, God. Give them a heart, oh God, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Father, we pray tonight, God, that you will hear us, oh God. Meet every need, oh God, according to your riches and glory. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, that you will have your way, oh God. Strengthen us, oh God. Give us wisdom and knowledge, oh God, that we may continue to press our way in this pilgrim journey tonight, God. Father, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for all that you're about to do in the midst tonight, God. Go before us and level every mountain, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody say amen. Hallelujah, you may be seated. Hallelujah. And be awful for Bishop and our First Lady, Davy. We want to welcome each and every one tonight to the New Life Church. And if it's your first time in the New Life Church, you're welcome tonight. If it's your second or third time, we count you as a family. Amen. And so we are going to go into our announcement now. Family, we are updating our record and need your most recent detail. Please complete the also connection form from scanning the QR code to visit the NLT that come slash also all children and adults in your also are to be updated in our email glory be to God hallelujah hallelujah for avoiding a duplicate account be sure to include anniversary birthday if you already complete the form online there is no need to complete it again unless your information has been changed the NLT greenhouse market is a pathway for us to fulfill the vision that the Lord has given to our bishop. Please consider visiting the in the back. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Please visit over there. We have pot, 20 pot for $7.50 each. Additional, the greenhouse market will be selling vegetable immediately after service in the fellowship hall with special sale. And tomato. Hallelujah. I don't know if I know I got anyone in the house that love tomato tonight, but we have a special sale on tomato. All marriage, all marriage couple are invited to our special couple enrichment this Saturday. Someone said this Saturday in the NLT at 8 a.m. A hot breakfast will be served along with good time. Somebody should be excited about that. Glory be to God. As a reminder, there is no children church this Sunday. We will worship all together as a family for the Easter. Hallelujah. Zone Breaker class are going live tonight for mentor mentorship and elective. Here is the schedule. Kids 3 to 12, Sunbeam, Yamat, and I am special. Hallelujah. Youth 13 to 18, YLA, why move? Elective class. You and your money tonight. Hallelujah. We have a class for you and your money. So somebody say, you and your money. Christian living discipleship. 
Lesson two, new member final class, selection three and four. Hallelujah, all happening tonight in the education wing, family life center, and the fellowship all in this mission. Hallelujah. Tonight, be reminded our nursery is open in the west wing. Glory be to God. Somebody give God praise tonight. Hallelujah. Let us draw our turn mind as we go before God with our offering. Please stand to our feet. I don't know if you're excited tonight about offering, but I got a lot of testimony of God has done great things for me. I don't get a lot of time to talk about it. Because if I should talk about it, it would take the whole night. But God has opened door so much. A few days ago, I bought uh, a little, little car. You know those little cars you drive around the parking lot for like $500. And the next two days, I sell it for $2,400. So don't tell me that God will increase you. If you try him, glory be to God, he will increase you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come tonight, God, with what you have given to us, God. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. It doesn't belong to us, God, but it belongs to you, Lord. So, Father, we come tonight, God, with what you have given to us, God, and we're giving it back to you, Lord. Father, we pray that you will double it, God, quadruple it, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for increase in this church. Oh, God, we pray that nobody will live undone tonight. God, but multiply. God, those who are in need of job, Father, we pray that job will open up, God. Door of promotion, God. Father, we will testify of the goodness of you in the land of the living. Father, we pray tonight, God, as we give back to you what you have given to us, God. Remember those who don't have, Lord. We pray that you will touch them, oh, God. That may they also have to give a next time. Father, we thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah.
how many know that the blood of Jesus washes white as snow? If you've been washed in the blood, somebody wave your hand like this. If you've been washed in the blood, shout hallelujah as loud as you can. Thank you, Jesus. Wash as white as snow. clap your hands onto the Lord everybody praise God do me a favor shake at least three or four hands around you just tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord amen smile at somebody real good tell them you appreciate them amen show the love of Christ if it's somebody you don't know make it a point of your duty to go over there and introduce yourself amen and say hello to them and connect with them amen so that they're no strangers Praise God in the house of the Lord. Amen. All right. You may be seated for just a little while. We have a, a quick announcement before I come back up. Uh, Minister Matt O'Neill coming to share some stuff with us relative to outreach. Would you clap your hands for him as he comes? Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we say outreach? Can we say outreach? All right, so this Saturday we have two amazing opportunities where we all can get involved. And so the first one is we have the exploration, all right? That will be held downtown starting from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. There will be games, food, and most of all, souls. So the whole family of churches will be out there. Is anybody excited to win souls? Amen. And so I'm being told that the best part is there's a slide out there. So um, there's a slide next to this one on the slideshow. <laughs> Amen. Pardon me. Um, but there will also be uh, slides out there as well. Um, and so this event is uh, pretty much a community event. There's, they're going to have like games. They're going to be, uh, uh, as you can may not be able to see there, uh, they're going to have face painting, bounce houses that have slides, okay, and then the Easter bag decorating, all right, they're going to have the roaming balloon artists, and then they're going to have the Tampa Bay Lightning, it's going to be out there, uh, they're going to have bike helmet giveaway, then they're going to also have the spin to win wheel, all right, and also the New Life South Tampa is going to have potato sack races, um, and they're going to have some other activities that we're all able to get involved in. So who's excited about this event this Saturday? And again, we want the whole family of churches to be involved in that. All right. And so our second event on Saturday is going to be held here. All right. We're going to be going out to our own backyard, we're going to be reaching out to our neighbors. All right. We're delivering goodie bags for them. And this begins at 1030 from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. And if you would like more information about this, please see Minister Drew Callum and Sister Terica Marcellus after service tonight to sign up. Um, and then also, if you did already sign up, uh, there will be some shirts for the first 20 that signed up. Um, they will have your shirts for you tonight after service. So please see them after service. And let's go win some souls. Amen? Amen. Y'all got to do better than that. Let's clap our hands, amen, for these outreach team members. And what they're trying to do is, is get us all involved in outreach in some way, shape, or form. Of course, we want to see everyone in the house for Resurrection Sunday. 
And wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if the entire house was filled? Amen. The more people we bring, the more can be exposed to the gospel and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Brother Solomon has already thrown down the gauntlet. He challenged some folks. Brother Marvin is up here. He challenged back. And there's some other people who said they're going to bring the most people. And so we're going to see by Sunday night, we will know who actually brought the most people. But do what you can. Bishop stepped up and said he's going to give some money to whoever brought the most people. Amen. And I'm sending them to Ruth Chris for the first steak dinner. Praise God. So whatever works. Amen. But we, we've got to reach the lost with Bible salvation. Um, and as much people as we can reach with the word of God, amen, lives will be changed and set free and delivered, and that's what we want. Let's stand to our feet at this time, amen. Ministers, remember we have a quick meeting immediately after service, so don't disappear, all of our licensed ministers. We have a good man of God that's coming to preach the word of the Lord to us tonight. Uh, we thank God for him, appreciate him so much. Uh, he always edifies us and gives us something that we ought to consider something that's transformative. We love his family very much. Minister Lemuel Harris, as he comes to preach the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, new life. Amen. Good to see you all tonight. Thank God that I'm here, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Amen. Tonight, we're going to continue our series in uh, stewardship. And tonight, more specifically, I'm discussing the characteristics of a faithful steward. The characteristics of a faithful steward. Tonight, I'll be uh, teaching. I prefer to teach, to slow it down a little bit and teach a little bit. So we'll be doing that tonight. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and pray for tonight's lesson. Thank God for our bishop, our leadership, and families, our pastor. We're grateful. How many are grateful for good leadership? I mean, we do appreciate them. And I will encourage you to keep them in prayer. And uh, not only that, let's see what we can do to help out around here. Amen? That makes sense? Yeah, you guys are praying for people. Y'all clap for that because you get up and pray for five minutes and then you're done for the day. <laughs> I tell people come help. Like, yeah, we'll pray for you. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy toward us, oh God. Thank you for calling us, oh God, with this great calling, oh God. Thank you for anointing us and calling us to some great purpose for your will and your glory. Lord, we pray that you give us, oh God, all that we need, the characteristics that we need to accomplish all that you've called us to do. We love you. We love the work of the ministry. We love all that you do, oh God, knowing that it's perfect and pure. And we give you glory in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing tonight. We're going to the book of Matthew. I know uh, I'm kind of going different order tonight. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 uh, is where we'll begin with our text. There's going to be two portions of scripture in which uh, we'll read tonight, Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. It's somewhat lengthy, but we do have a little bit of time tonight. I have two points tonight, and I heard almost a clap. Don't clap yet. My first point is very detailed. Amen. So you just know. <laughs> Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. We'll read verses 14 through 30, and I apologize in the back. I didn't scribble down my text like I normally do, so I'll slow down to make sure that you can keep up with us. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14, the word of the Lord reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto him his goods, them his goods, excuse me, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, uh, to, the, uh, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 24, then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant. Says to him, and you know, pretty much you lazy bum. <laughs> he says, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I strawed, or not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that I'm sorry, he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The second portion of scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's only one verse there, very short portion of scripture there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, but yet very relevant to our lesson tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in just verse 2. And the Bible reads, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Everybody say faithful. 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 So again, tonight we're talking about being a faithful steward, and we're going to discuss more specifically the characteristics of a faithful steward. If uh, The Bible says then that uh, we ought to, be faithful stewards, and I want to know what a faithful steward is. I want to become whatever the Lord wants me to be. Amen. So we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. We're going to begin with a few definitions, or a couple of definitions. Um, definitions are important when you're studying the Word of God. It's good to really look at it and understand what you're reading. I just don't want to look at Scripture and, and say, yeah, I heard that Scripture. Um, I've heard it growing up, but I don't know what it means. The Lord has called me on it, um, even in prayer. There's times I've prayed and I think I specifically was using some term that David used or one of the psalmists. I, I will extol thee. He said, what that mean? I said, I don't know. So in the middle of <laughs> prayer, let me go look it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do that then. Yeah. Because in reality, one, it's hard to really serve the Lord uh, if you don't know what he's asking you to do. Uh, you just don't want to quote scripture. Amen. So we're talking about studying tonight. We're talking about really getting into the word of God. Because I want to live for God. I just don't want to be religious. I want to know God. I want to talk to God. I want to be close to God. I want to know what he's telling me. I don't want to just shake my head, nod my head, yes to God, and I don't know what he's talking about. What good is that going to do? I want to know what he's talking about. So I, when I study, I tend to look at definitions. You know, like the word study, as a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the word study there doesn't imply uh, that we need to go and study, not that we don't need to study the Word of God. Uh, study, as we tend to, tend to use it in our vernacular, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. The Bible says, study to shoot thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Oftentimes, we do use it to, to encourage people to study the Word of God, and of course, you need to do that. But the term there, study, actually does not mean study as in uh, devoting time and attention to learning a particular thing. That's not what the word study there means. The word study there actually means to be diligent, uh, to, to, to put everything that you have into doing a particular thing. So the word means, so the scripture is really saying, be diligent to live right for God. It's what it's really talking about within the correct context when you read all of the scripture. And the word study there means to be diligent. I bring that up because we have to look at definitions every once in a while. Because the English language is interesting in that, um, you know, it'll confuse you. It's the same word. You look at it, when you read it, you have to look at it within the context and you say, oh, that's what that's really meaning. Because it could say, you could say one thing, it can say aisle, but it might be talking about an island or it could be talking about the aisle that you walk down. Uh, so, you know, that's how the English language is. So it is with this particular word here that I'm using as an example. So when we read the text in 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 2, more of it is required in, serve, in stewards that the man be found faithful. We want to know what a steward is, and we also want to know uh, what it means to be faithful. Because we know that we're called to be stewards, um, and the stewards have a requirement as well. So first, let's consider the word steward. 
And I want you to repeat after me, all right? The worst, well, not right now, I'll tell you when. Because, you know, when I was in school, we, anyway, never mind. <laughs> the word is oikonomos, oikonomos. Somebody say, what? Everybody say that, oikonomos. Good, I didn't want to be the only one saying it wrong. So I appreciate you. That's pretty much it. That's the transliteration of the word. But it means this in definition. The manager of a household or the household affairs, especially a steward, manager, superintendent, whether freeborn as uh, was usually the case, a freed man or a slave, watch this, to whom the head of the house or uh, proprietary uh, was, has entrusted the management of his affairs, uh, the care of receipts and expenditures, and the duty of dealing out the proper portion to every servant and even to the children not yet of age. So what a steward was, someone that was given the responsibility and uh, the, the, the resources to, to manage for somebody else, his master or what have you, okay? And so the scripture is saying that we ought to be individuals who recognize, one, we've, we've been given not only resources but a responsibility to do with those resources whatever our master or our Lord wants, right? So everything that we have, we have to recognize, one, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. And so everything belongs to God. It's not this is my house, this is my body, this is my this. You ain't got nothing. You just got here. All this stuff has been here before you got here, and you're only here because God said so, okay? So ultimately, everything belongs to God. That's why it's nothing strange when uh, the Lord says, well, I need you to give this, and I need you to give that, and here's where you need to give it to, because it belongs to him anyway. I'm just grateful that he doesn't ask for all of it, and I have to struggle with maybe a little bit. He's so gracious that he'll say, you know what, give me 10%, but you take the 90 and do this or that with it. And so he's a really good God in that though he owns everything, he only acts for a small amount. Oftentimes, we'll say, how much? Oh, my goodness, that seems like a lot. He's like, well, actually, 100% is mine. You want to give me that? Well, no, you know what? <laughs> That's a pretty good deal in my opinion. Hello? It's a pretty good deal. Um, you say, well, I work really hard. I gave you the strength to work really hard because you could be a paraplegic. You can be struggling mentally. You can have all kinds of issues where somebody else has to take care of you. And so thank God for the faculty of my mind and limbs that I can go out and do the work that I do. Thank you for the competence um, that I do have and the intelligence to be able to do certain things because some people um, don't have that ability. And I'm grateful that God has given me that ability because even that belongs to him. And the air that flows through my body belongs to him. So I'm grateful that I have an opportunity. That's why it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because I have the ability to give when somebody else doesn't have the ability to give. We have the grace to be able to give. Uh, so I'm grateful for the ability for that. Amen. And so uh, we have to recognize then we ought to be, uh, that we are indeed stewards. But we just don't want to be stewards. Somebody that's entrusted to do something. Uh, because you can entrust somebody to do something, and they do a horrible job with it. And you look at them like, man, I shouldn't have given you anything. I, I could have messed it up myself, right? I remember some years ago, uh, I owned a home in Carrollwood and had somebody come to look at the AC unit that wasn't acting quite right. And by the time they left, it was acting worse. And boy, thank God for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm like, man, you messed up my AC unit. Eventually, I figured out a way to rig it that didn't, well, anyway, it worked long enough. I'm not going to even look on that side. But just know that we were cool at some point in time. Amen. But eventually, we did have to replace it. Amen. But, um, but yeah, some people can mess up something that you give them to do, you entrust them to do. But we don't want to mess up the things of God and what God has given us. We, we're grateful for what God has done. Therefore, we want to be faithful stewards. The term faithful here is just pistos, and I got that right, so you don't have to go along with me. That word means trusty, faithful of persons who show themselves faithful in the transaction of watch, of business. It's not just being faithful with a particular thing. God wants us to have a mindset uh, whereby we are conducting ourselves in business in a particular way that he can be proud of, and I'll explain that uh, in a little bit. It means the execution of commands or the discharge of official duties. One who kept his plighted faith worthy of trust that can be relied on easily. And watch this. The, the second part of that is this. Easily persuaded, believing, confiding, and trusting. That's something. 
Somebody that's faithful is also an individual that has a lot of faith, apparently, in this as well. And we'll get into that. And what I really want from God is God to be well pleased with me. I looked at how the Lord said to those faithful servants, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. That is what I'm looking for. I don't know about every. I, no, I know everybody else in here wants to hear that. You want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And because we want that, we desire that, that's why we're here tonight, not just to kill some time, but we want to be faithful stewards and individuals in which God can look at and say, you know what, I trust you. I, I, I can give you some great things. I, I can bless you. I want to be that individual. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, here tonight. So first thing, let's consider uh, the scripture in which we read in Matthew 25, 24 through 26, verses 24 through 26. The Bible says, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering there, I'm sorry, gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid. And went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not straw. So we're going to consider the contrast between the unfaithful and faithful steward. If you look at the scripture, the Lord did not uh, rebuke this last servant for his mode or his method of handling the resources. He didn't say, you did what with it? You could have done this. You could have done that. Here are some better uh, strategies that you could have used. He didn't talk about the strategy because we know that this particular individual, instead of going out and uh, starting a business, in particular, we, we would call it like trading stock or whatever, or, or business. It's really trading uh, is what they went into. But uh, this individual here said, you know, I'm going to go and save it. It's almost like putting it in a savings account. And he just put it in there. He saved it. So he says he wasn't really talking about the method per se. But what he did address was the character of this individual. He went beyond the method. And he says, here's why you did what you did. It's because you're wicked and you're slothful. He says you're lazy and you're, you, you're not even thinking about the things that your Lord really desires for you to think about. I said, man, he's dealing with the man's character. And above everything else, when we're talking about giving in any capacity, I believe God is trying to touch something related to our character. God desires us to be like him. He really wants us to be like him from the very beginning. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. I want you to be in my image. I want you to be in my likeness. I want your character to be like mine is what God desires. He says, now, I'm not wicked and I'm not lazy. And I don't want anybody that's wicked, and I don't want anybody that's lazy. So he's dealing with the character of this individual. And I found out that one of the primary things that uh, we need to do if we're going to become faithful stewards is to have, number one, the characteristics of humility. Humility. Uh, humility in that oftentimes what God will do is he'll put us in situations, things may not work out as well as we like, uh, and we will, we will bind every devil, we'll, forget, we'll forbid every spirit to operate, we'll blame every devil, and we'll have somebody fast with us, and everybody's hungry. But the problem could very well be your character is why it's not working out. But more often than not, to stay, hey, maybe it's because of me. There's some issue with me. We're not really doing that. Humility, we have to, number one, recognize, you know what, I might not be perfect. How many know you're not perfect? I saw about five hands, and I saw, I'm just kidding, I saw a lot more hands than that. I said, you wicked and slothful people, put your hand up. But no, <laughs> I'm kidding. But no, it's our character sometimes is the problem. And it's probably the last thing we think of addressing. Is that brother over there, that sister over there, is whatever. It could very well be that the one that needs to be bound and forbidden to operate is the guy I see in the mirror every morning. Look at that guy and say, you it. But it takes some humility to do that. We have to be humble. We see humility displayed among these individuals, including the lazy servant. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 15, and unto one he gave five talents to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. The Lord gave talents based on his perception of their abilities. It wasn't based on their perception of their abilities. 
a lot of times we think, well, I should be doing this, or I could be doing that, and I could, and I could, and I would, and I should. If it weren't for them, I would. If it wasn't for this, I would. And the Lord said, no, no. I'm looking at what you can. I've given you everything you need to accomplish everything you need to do. And what we need to do is say, Lord, thank you for the abilities that you've given me. Help me do the best that, watch, I can do with what you have given me. We have to be able to do that. I don't need to look at somebody else and wonder why they're blessed with whatever they have. That's irrelevant. Lord, bless them. Keep doing, keep striving, keep pressing on. If they got five and I got two, I better do the best that I can with my two. I need to say, Lord, give me the insight. Give me the wisdom. Give me all the characteristics I need to make sure that I do what I can with this two so that one day you'll say, well done. Because here's the, here's the thing about it. For the one that had five and the one that had two, he says, well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord, didn't he? Absolutely. So I'm saying, look, let me just get that. You might have did more with your five. Maybe you got more work to do, but I'll take my two and do whatever I need to do with my two. Sometimes we're fighting for more work. I don't need more work. Hey, Amen. I'm just trying to get in. You say, we're just trying to slide in. I'm just getting in with whatever he gave me to get in with. You understand? So I don't need to look at everybody else. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commended themselves. So we don't want to be like people that commend themselves. Yeah, you know, I'm doing a good job. He says, I don't want to be doing that. Because what they're doing is they're looking at everybody else. I'm doing better than you. Maybe you're not doing the best you can. Just because you're doing better than me doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing the best that God wants you to do. So you need to be looking at God and saying, God, am I doing all right here? Is this good enough for you? Because the only one I'm trying to please is God. I'm not trying to please man. I'm not trying to please anybody down here. I want God. God is the only one. When he says, well done, good and faithful servant, I know that's a good sound. But when somebody else says it, I don't know. You could be comparing me against somebody else that's not doing great down here. Sometimes we compare ourselves with the wrong people. He says we dare not compare ourselves among ourselves. It's not wise. I don't want to compare myself against somebody else. Don't compare yourself to me. I'm not that great anyway. So if you're better than me, you might still be bad. Because <laughs> here I am bad and you're just a little less bad. Well, whoop de do. you're still not good either. So both of them, I'm just bad. Err, I'm worse than you are. So don't compare yourself with me. Yeah, that, that's not going to do you any good. What you need to do is, is, is get your affirmation from the one that matters. Lord, what, what, what do you say? Am I, I'm okay here. And so we're not trying to compare ourselves among ourselves. It's simply not wise. So humility is where we want to start off with and say, Lord, I want to make sure I'm humble. I'm, I'm just focusing on you. I'm focused on whatever you have me to do, and I'm focused on what you've given me specifically to do. Amen? So we need to start there uh, mentally. Then here's five other things I'm going to mention, but I can't take credit for some of the verbiage I'm going to use, so I'm going to make sure that I uh, make mention of this. So this self-made millionaire I listened to uh, briefly at one point in time um, on the YouTube, on his channel. His name is Daniel Alley. This guy says that he was once really poor, um, on, on welfare, or they, his family was homeless um, even before he got on welfare. So I guess welfare was a step up. At some point, they were they were homeless. They struggled, and uh, he always hoped. When he said he said when he was a kid, he always hoped that someday some millionaire would come into his life and then give him some money and give him the steps to take and, and do all types of things uh, that he always dreamed of doing. He said it never happened. You know, I know we pray, Lord, if you can send somebody into my life or send somebody into the church and do this or that. Listen, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not going to say don't pray that prayer because I'm still, I, I'm praying that prayer. I be, I'm not stupid. I'll take it. You, you, you come and offer me some million dollars tonight. Yes, I'll take it. You know, I'm not, I'm not too proud to beg. I will, I will take it and be, be grateful. You, you'll see me crying and I'll just spend all night here praying and crying. And, I'll, and my wife will say, that's fine, because, you know, she's going to be packing the house up because we're moving. You understand? So I'll be over here rejoicing, and she over there packing. <laughs> Teamwork make the dream work. So, 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 so that's fine. However, in the meantime, right, I need to do what I need to do, right? I want to make sure that I'm doing what God has called me to do. 
in the meantime. So this guy said that's what he was hoping for. It never happened. And so what he did was he, he started the podcast and um, this channel and just to explain how he ultimately became a millionaire. So he's worth probably $5 million or so. Uh, so, I mean, you know, that's, doing, that's pretty good. And uh, so he said he wanted to explain to people how to get it done, how to get it done come from the bottom up. But he says there's, there's five reasons why the rich typically avoid the poor. That's what he says. And the people, you know, oftentimes individuals with a lot of money and individuals that don't have a lot of money, they don't really hang out a lot, more often than not, for probably several reasons. But he says he wants to share with individuals, here's why. Um, it's, it's not because individuals are just mean. It's, you know, sometimes you say, well, they just, they mean, they don't want to deal with people. They got all that money, and they should give to everybody. They don't want to be dealing with that. I don't want anybody asking me for money every day either, to be honest. Thank you. I got one year. Amen. You say, well, that's, that's being selfish and so forth. Well, I mean, honestly, it only can last so long, and you have to em employ it the right way so that you can continue being a blessing to individuals. But at any rate, so, but what he said was this, five things, and I'm, I'm, plus I'm putting his name out there so you won't get mad at me when I bring up the five things. So it's strategic. His name is Daniel Alley. Not, no, not Davey. Although I don't, I'm, well, I'm not going to put you out there, Bishop, but I'm almost sure you probably say some of the same stuff Daniel Alley says. Because what he says is actually true, um, but sometimes it may be hard hitting, which is why humility is so important. Number one. He says this. Here's the issues, and we're going to intertwine it with the scripture that we read, and we're going to look at the individual that was an unjust, faithful, I'm sorry, unfaithful servant, and the uh, faithful ones. So we're going to look at it in that way. He says this. He says, number one, um, individuals are underdeveloped is the term he used. He said generally individuals that don't have a lot of money, they're simply underdeveloped is the term he used. What he meant by that is this, and he goes on to explain. He says, people tend to live below their potential. A lot of times we don't like to hear that. But again, with humility, I say, maybe I haven't developed myself enough. You see how it puts the onus on us? Yeah. Puts the onus on us. It puts it right back on us. It's like, well, I haven't had the opportunities and things like that. And we'll get to uh, where we, we tend to sometimes point the blame. But he says that we're underdeveloped. Here's what he was really pointing at, is that sometimes what we need to do to make sure that we're being faithful to God and, and, and God being able to increase us in various things, we need to simply learn something that we don't know. We have to engage ourselves into uh, a learning, reading uh, material and, and, and going to classes and things like that and say, you know what, I need to learn more to develop myself more. It's not so much that God is saying, well, you know, as long as you, you pray and you live right, I can give you this. It doesn't make you a good steward over resources because you pray a lot. Yeah. You can pray and speak in tongues all day and nobody know what you're saying and still be wasteful and still do some things that you ought not to do only because you just don't know. Praying uh, doesn't necessarily download information into you. What you need to do is be disciplined enough to put down other stuff and say, I'm going to learn this particular task. What the unfaithful servant did, he, was, he said, I'm not going to try to learn this thing. Probably what the one that had five, he probably wasn't necessarily employed in any particular business venture. The one that had two, probably in the same boat. But he says, you know what, I want to do the best that I can. Let me go see what I can do that's better than what I'm doing right now. How many of us sit back and say, you know what, let me evaluate where I am right now and let me see if I can do better than what I can right now because God has gifted me with something. God has given me something. I want to go and do the best that I can with it, but I don't know how, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. I need to watch. I need to learn how. You see? Sometimes it's simply that. Sometimes we don't do well in some business things that we've tried because we just don't know how. Well, you know, the market this and it just didn't work in my favor. No, friend, you just need to stick around. You need to learn from somebody that knows how to do it. I remember Bishop teaching many years ago, and he was saying, you know what, before you go start a business, you probably need to work in that business for several years first so you can understand the underpinnings of the business. You need to understand this is how it works, this is how it's done, and all of those things. I remember when I first started, uh, I was starting a business. Um, 
this is before I started any of the business that I did start. But um, I, I wanted to stop working where I was working. I probably like a lot of people out here say, I want to start my own business. Why do you want to start your own business? I don't want to work for anybody. Puh. You have your own business. You work for everybody. D yeah. You don't take any days off. When you work for somebody else, you can point to the boss. But you know what? When you work for, when everybody work for you, guess where everybody else pointing? Amen. So you work for everybody. <laughs> and so, um, I, so I said, man, you know what? I want to get out of this particular job. And uh, someone was, I saw in the flyer, this little thing that they used to uh, hand out, the, the flyer. We, on, we go online now. But then anyway, I looked at it, I said, hey, this guy's selling his business. He's selling it for so much. The truck, it was a, a, a business where you deliver packages and so forth with a, a large company. And uh, they contracted doing it. He was going to sell this contract. And I was like, man, you know what? I'll just be able to drive around, drop off packages, and I'll have to deal with people, and I'll have to deal with this, and I'll have to deal with that. Sounded good. And based on what he said the, uh, the contract was all about, it paid more, probably $20,000 more a year than what I was making. And I said, man, I'll do it. And I was much younger at the time, and I was just ready to, to give him my money and take over that contract. But the guy did something that was so wonderful, and I appreciate it till this day. He said to me, he says, you know, before we do this, why don't you come with me one day and see what it's like? And in my head, young, silly, I said to myself in my head, I don't even care. I'm just trying to get out of where I'm at and be my own boss. But I said, okay, cool. He said, all right, I'll be in tomorrow at 4.30 a.m. What? <laughs> First risk. <laughs> 4, 4 30 in the morning. I said, yeah, that's cool. I mean, you know, but at least it's my bed. I should be off early. So he comes, 4.30, he comes in his little sports car, picks me up. I hop in. We go not too far from my house uh, to the distribution center. Do what we need to do there. We go out through our, our day, and as we're going through the day, he's telling me all of the costs associated with it. The insurance, the cost for the vehicle, the cost for this and cost for that. And in my head, I'm thinking, carry the one, divide by two, E equals MC squared. I ain't making that much more money <laughs> than I'm making. So after I did all the calculations in my head, by the end of the day, which is about 6 o'clock, 6.30, from 4.30 in the morning, 6.30, I'm looking at how little time I have, no time off because I'm the only driver, nobody I can just hand anything over to. I'm I, just in one day, less than 24 hours, I'm realizing maybe I was wrong. And by the time he dropped me off, I had too much pride to say anything right then and there. I went in the house, I wrote stuff down on paper, Balled that up, did it again, and it came back the same every time. How much I was going to have to pay out and all of those things, I called that guy up and said, hey, man, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Sometimes we simply need to educate ourselves. That way we get ourselves into things that make sense for us. It might be good for somebody else, but for me, no, sir, it wasn't good for me. Not everything is best for you. You need to educate yourself. The guy says, you know what? People simply aren't willing to do the work to educate themselves. We need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I thank you for what you've given me, but I need to build on what you've given me, the knowledge and the information, so that I can go out and do a good thing. So make sure that you do that. That's number one. Number two, he says, too many excuses. He says, rich don't like dealing with the poor. Too many excuses. He says, really what it is, it boils down to not enough imagination. And he says this. He says, it's not enough faith. They don't have enough faith. So what he's dealing with here is individuals who blame everybody else. They blame the government, blame the system, blame historical atrocities, whatever. Blaming everything else around them, but never saying, here's how I can overcome whatever it may be. We need to think differently. It's not because I'm this or because my parents were that or because there's some system that's going to get out there that I can't really pinpoint the, the details of the system, but I just know it keeps me down. None of that. All of that is nonsense, the guy's saying. The guy's saying, look, what we really need to do is be able to think more creatively and say, you know what? I'm thinking outside the box on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to figure something else out because I can't stay here. We can't blame everybody else. Here's exactly what that servant did. 
Matthew 25, 24, he had excuses. He says, then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. He says, man, you're just making excuses. Don't make any excuses. Figure it out. Yeah, figure it out. You have to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to think through this. I'm, I've educated myself. Maybe this might not work, but maybe this will. And give it a shot. Give it a try. Do your best at that thing. Because God is expecting you to do so. He's not ex what we expect from God is for God to step in and just do all the stuff for us. And God, on the other hand, is looking back and waiting for us to step in and do what he's given us the ability to do. And if both of us are standing there waiting for the other one to move, let me tell you something. God is still going to be God whether I move or not. I'm the one that needs to get this stuff done. So I'm saying, God, you know what? I'll take the first step. And when you take that step in, God will step in and help you out. But until you start moving and trying to do something, my, most likely God will do absolutely, positively nothing. God is, I'll match your giving. <laughs> I'll match your efforts. You say, God, I'm praying hard. He said, well, I'm praying too. Lord, do it. Lord, no, I can't ask me to do it because I'm not going to even answer my own prayer. He'll match your efforts. So, so if you're doing everything that you can, God will be prompted to do everything he can. And I need God to do everything that he can do. That means even if I don't feel like I'm capable of doing everything, God, I'm at least trying to do everything that I possibly can because I believe you're going to step in eventually and help me out. It's no way God is going to watch you toil and try, trying to do the best that you can with what he's giving you, and he just sit back and watch. What kind of God is that? That's not the kind of God I serve. I, look, I serve a God that says, man, look, I, I can't just leave you out there alone. I'm going to step in. I'm going to do the best that I can with you. And when it works, I'm going to have to give God all the glory because he's the one that stepped in and made it work. But I got to step in first. Many times we're saying we're waiting on God. You prayed that prayer over and over again, and God is saying, yes, go ahead and get it done. And you're still saying, well, God, I'm waiting for the results. God is saying, no, 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 you're waiting for the results. You need to do in order to get the results. Don't blame anybody else. Don't stop blaming the devil. You say, well, the devil has some plan. That rebuke him and get it done. Go ahead and start doing what you need to be doing. Don't always blame him. Well, he pointed, the devil way over here. The de matter of fact, sometimes, probably most of the time, the devil has nothing to do with it because he knows you're not going to do anything either. He's not going to waste his time messing with you. He's not omnipresent. He got bigger things to be dealing with. You're talking about a devil trying to deal with your stuff. The devil over here trying to mess with government. The devil's trying to be more efficient. He's trying to be in all of our business. Many times it's not the devil at all. It is us. What we need to do is say, thank God he's busy over there. Let me step in and do what I need to do and God will help me. Maybe he'll get, you'll get the devil's attention when you start doing, but you'll also get God's attention. And my God is greater than any devil, any spirit, any principality, any power. He's able to bind all that up, but we're trying to bind it up before it's even doing anything. You cast in the net and the devil's not even there. Thirdly, he says we're unwilling to sacrifice. So when we talk about giving to the church, it's, it's developing in us um, two things, I think, at least two things. One is a love for the things of God, which, which I, I think has been, been, been discussed uh, very well in the last two classes, but it ought to develop in us the love of God, or we ought to be demonstrating the love of God. When we give to the house of God and to individuals, it's because we love them and we want to see souls saved, period. To me, it's not about I give to God, he's going to give me something back. Yeah, he will. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that ought not to be my motivation. I think God wants us to be motivated because we love individuals. We know that this place is trying to save the souls of individuals. Therefore, I want to give because I want to support the salvation of souls. That's one. But the other thing, what it develops in us is a willingness to sacrifice. A willingness to sacrifice some stuff for a season. And sometimes the sacrifice 
uh, it could be time, money, whatever it may be, but it's sacrificing to the things of God. It requires that. Sacrifice uh, requires a particular type of heart inside of an individual that's saying, you know what, I'm going to give something that costs me. It costs me. It's not all about me. It's about somebody else and something else that's bigger than me. It gives me a better perspective of who I am when I give beyond me and mine. And I'm willing to take care of something bigger than I. So willingness to sacrifice then, what he's getting at here more so, this, this gentleman that I've been speaking about, is, is really this. Is, he says becoming wealthy, before you become wealthy, he said you become broke many times. And some of us say, man, I should be quite about there now. Them times we've been broke. But he says you, be, be get, you become broke many times. He says what it is, individuals don't want to make the sacrifice for the season. Uh, you don't want to give up uh, a, that feeling of whatever security that you may have at the moment for something greater later on down the line. Sometimes we spend money on things we ought not to spend money on. That's true. But sometimes we don't also, uh, we, neither, rather, neither do we uh, try to invest our resources in something that's going to cause us to do better later on. So it's twofold. It's not so much I'm just not spending it frivolously. But instead, I'm using it to be better later on. Does that make sense? I want to be better later on. So I may have to use funds instead of paying for uh, YouTube or Netflix or whatever. I'm going to use it to pay for Audible or, or for something that's going to help me learn. I'm going to read more books. I'm going to do this stuff. I'm going to reinvest the money in things that don't give me necessarily pleasure at the current moment. But it's going to build me up so that I can do something better later on down the line. That's the type of sacrifice that he's talking about. Because you always sacrifice. You just have to choose your sacrifice. So either you're going to get the pleasure of things now, but you're not going to get the great things that God has for you later, or you're going to sacrifice the things that you want now so that you can get the things that God wants for you to have later on. But you will sacrifice whether you think you are or not. So you have, at least you have an option of, of the sacrifice. And I'm thinking, you know what? Let me go ahead and sacrifice some of the things that I enjoy today so that I can get the greater things later on down. We have to choose our sacrifice. And sometimes individuals are simply scared to fail. They're scared to fail. And I'm not going to read all of the scripture. You can read it on your own time in Judges chapter 20. But in Judges chapter 20, we find uh, Israel. It's in a real uh, crazy uh, situation here. But the bottom line is one of the um, one of the tribes had sinned greatly. They had um, sexually abused a woman. She ended up dying, and 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 just some other crazy stuff happened. And the other tribes were saying, "Look, we need to go chastise them because they're wicked." Well, what happens is they go down to chastise that one small tribe, and they lose the battle. Judah goes up first and loses the battle. So they go before God and say, hey, we're trying to do the right thing and chastise them because we don't want this wickedness in the land. Should we go back again and fight them? The Lord says, go get them. They go back again, and they fell again. People die. They've been destroyed. All of that. And they were like, come on, I thought we're supposed to. One, we're doing the right thing. Two, watch God told us to do it, but we're failing. So they go weep, they fast, they go before God, and I'm trying to hurry the close. They go before God, <clears throat> ask him again, should we go back again? It's two times we done went trying to do what we thought was the right thing, and lives are being destroyed here now at the same time. Guess what God tells them? Go again. Sometimes what we need to do when we fail is go again. The, the, here's what we sometimes, must not be the will of God. It's still the will of God. Go again. Well, you know what? I, I, maybe that's not my thing. It's your thing. Go again. The issue is you don't have enough resiliency. What you need is to be resilient. You're probably going to fail every once in a while. You're going to mess up, and it's going to look real bad. People are going to look at you funny. People may say, well, I don't think you, that's really your thing. Maybe that's not the will of God. You better have enough connection with God to know that God has sent you, God has called you, God has put it in you, God knows what he's doing, and you need to say, I'm going to go again, and I'm going to do it again, and I'll do it again, and I'm going to do it until it comes to pass. 
It's all right people look at you crazy. They can look all they want, but look long enough to watch God work because it will work ultimately. So keep watching, keep looking, and you might not want to keep talking because God's going to shut you up in a minute because I know what God has called me to do. Failure does not mean you give up. Failure means you just go again and go again and go again. That presupposes, one, you know who you are and you know who God has called you to be and God's on your side. And the last two, real quick, is this bad money habits. Some people try to play it safe is what he's saying here. Sometimes we don't want to take risks. Remember Bishop talking about Lee Atwater and his statement regarding taking more risks. Sometimes what we need to do is we need to be willing to take some risks, get out of that comfort zone. The guy says, you know what, I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the earth. He was afraid to take risks. Sometimes you simply need to say, I'm going to take the risk. What it is, it's just having enough faith. I'm going to take the risk, and if I fail, I'll get up and I'll try it again. If I fail and if that doesn't work, I'll figure out, I'll re-educate myself and try to figure out how to make it work. Because it might not work the first time because of me. It might not work the second time because of somebody else. But eventually I'm going to figure out how to get around me and somebody else because it must work. We got to get it done, and it will get done because I'm willing to go again. So we don't need to play it safe. And last, last thing, I'm not going to talk much about, but he says, you know, people are brainwashed. He says they get information from the wrong sources. Get your information from the right source. Lord, I, I'm, I'm focused on you. What, I, in, in the counsel of, uh, you know, when we get godly counsel and so forth, that's great also. But you also need to know God for yourself. Get your counsel from God, number one. Get somebody else that has some sense to give you some information as well. Get your information. And so ultimately, and I'm closing with this, I simply want to be a faithful steward. God told Joshua in one, uh, chapter 1 and 7, um, <clears throat> Joshua 1, he says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from, the, n- turn not right from it, from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. He says, look. Make sure that you focus on the word of God and hear the voice of God. Why don't you stick with that thing? But you have to be courageous. You need to be strong. He he wasn't saying it's going to be real easy when you go into this land. No, you're going to have to fight for this thing. I'm giving you the land, but you're going to have to be a good steward over the land. And to be a good steward, you got to be strong. You need to be very courageous. You need to have a lot of faith in God. You need to trust in God, and you need to give it all you got. And God will bless you to be a faithful steward. Amen. You You may stand. We're done. God is looking for a return on his investment in you. He's invested in all of us something. And you may need to dig for it. Maybe you dug it, dug a ditch in yourself and planted whatever God has in you and just leave it there. You need to dig back into yourself and say, what is it that God has planted in me? What has he given me that I'm hiding? And I want to be a blessing. We want to be a blessing to the house of God. We talked about giving this month, but God may say, hey, I want you to give more. He said, God, I don't have more. Well, maybe you have the talent and the gift to acquire more, but that you're not tapping into. Maybe that's the problem. Because a lot of times we're saying, God, you know, I've given all I, I can, but you're not giving anything back. He says, I have given something back. I've given you the ability to do something better than what you're doing, and that you're not using. Could it be that's the link? to your spiritual blessing, to your financial miracle. It's what God has given you, the talent, the creativity, something inside of you that you can go physically employ so that you can bring back something to the house of God and to your own house. Sometimes we're looking for a check in the mail. I I take that too. I give you my address after service. Just make sure you send a good check. But it could very well be, it's simply, here's what I'm giving you, the ability to do certain things, and that you're not tapping into. So let's ask God to help our character, change my character so I can be a faithful steward. Amen? Amen. I'm going to open up the altars for individuals who say, you know, I'm going to pray tonight. I'm going to ask God to change my character. Could it be some characteristics in me? I'm going to humble myself. and I'm just going to ask God to point those things out. What is it in me that might be holding me back? What is it that I'm not doing? Nothing wrong with retrospection. Look back and say, well, maybe I do that. And introspection is even better. So 
And we look back and say, man, this didn't work, that didn't, and this, that. But maybe it's introspection we actually need. Maybe I need to look inside myself instead. Stop looking at me. Look inside. So tonight is the night to look inside. To not look at maybe who's doing what or what devil's doing what. I tell you what you can control, you. Lord, change me. Make me the person that can overcome whatever the, con the, uh, the, the situations are, whatever the, the hindrances are. Because there may be hindrances. You may be pointing them out. But the hindrances aren't always going to just go away. You're going to have to move them. But you need the strength to move them. You need the wisdom to move them. So, Lord, change me. You don't have to change my situation, but make me stronger. Make me better. Make me wiser. And God will bless that. He'll be ready to bless that because he wants to bless you. Lord, bless you. I feel like there's some other folks that need to just step up to this altar right now. If there's somebody in the building that the enemy has tried to make you give up recently, you had a dream, you had a goal, you had a desire, something God put in your heart. Maybe you tried something and it failed or you went somewhere and it didn't work out. I want you to come on down to this altar. And I don't want you to worry about what anybody else says because based on the word that we just heard, our lives can change forever. And I felt something in my spirit as he was speaking that the Lord is telling someone tonight, here's the word for you, don't give up. Don't give up, whoever you are in this building. If you're at the altar, would you stretch your hand out to somebody's shoulder just to join with them as a point of faith? just as a point of faith say I can't afford to give up I can't afford to give up I can't afford to give up amen if you're still in the pew get beside somebody beside you so just let's just join together why because I can't afford to give up God wants me to go again can we lift our voice right now all over the building if you're at the altar lift your voice as loud as you can let's pray for each other let's ask God to help us father we thank you for this word that we've heard tonight I pray, Lord God, that this word will fall on good ground tonight and that it will bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Lord Jesus, we don't want to just be hearers of the word and not doers of the word, deceiving ourselves. Lord God, we want to hear this word and implement this word tonight. Lord Jesus, this word has come to challenge us. This word has come to cause us to look within ourselves. Lord God, this is a word of introspection, self-examination. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, whatever is in us that is hindering your will, whatever is in us that is blocking your plan, whatever is in us, Lord Jesus, that is blocking your purpose, I pray you move that out of us now in the name of Jesus. Do surgery on us tonight, Lord God. Extricate everything out of us that doesn't please you. Lord God, give us a mind to do your will, to fulfill your purpose, to put our shoulder to the wheel. Lord God, we rebuke every lazy spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We rebuke every character flaw. Lord God Almighty, we put ourselves on the altar tonight, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Help us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. You've given us a word, Lord God, that will tear down every stronghold that the enemy has tried to set up in our mind. I pray, Lord God, our minds will be dedicated to your will and to your purpose. Have your way in us, Lord. Help us never to give up. Help us never to give in. Help us to go again, Lord Jesus Christ, and do what you've called us to do. Lay your nail-scarred hand on your people tonight. Lord God, we give ourselves to you. Have your way in us, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory tonight. We give you all the honor tonight. We give you all the praise tonight. We declare it done tonight. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to fulfill your will. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill. 
every promise. Don't give up on God. Because He won't give up. My God is able. Thank you, Jesus. Shata da Bahaya. Come on, let's sing that to the Lord again. Let's sing it to Jesus tonight. Just what he said. He's going to fulfill every promise. Don't give up on God. Because he won't give up on you. He's a... Lift your hands, say, oh. Oh, 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 Thank you, Jesus, oh. Say he's able. 